the title of the, of the lesson today is In Chaos and Encouraged, because that is how I would sum up the, um, the last few months of my life, is I was in chaos, but I was encouraged. And I want you guys to realize that this sermon, this outline, um, the words I'm about to speak are a thank you letter to you all for helping me get through one of the uh, darkest, most difficult times uh, I ever, I mean, I never thought I would go through anything like that. And then uh, there it was, and I, made, I made, made it through because I was encouraged because I had a church behind me praying for me, writing me letters, writing me emails, um, not talking to me and asking me how I was doing when I would walk by them and we would just wink and we would know um, that they were asking how I was doing. But I knew I had you guys behind me, so thank you for giving me the space to get better. And here I am, and I'm looking forward to the new things that God is going to do through me from the lessons he's taught me and then through you all from the lessons he's taught you as well. So thank you. And I'm, no, I, I, we don't have time. I got to go. We don't have time for the... <laughs> Just kidding. All right. Anyways, there's my scar. If you want to see that, there it is. Woohoo. It really happened. It wasn't all a, a hoax. Uh, but I was in chaos. I was... Um, it was just tough, and, but now I've been there, done that, got the scar to prove it, so here we go. Um, first thing I wanna say is this is not a therapy session for me. You know, I, I'm gonna talk about some really personal things that I really don't like discussing. It's just, I'm a private person. You know, I, I, I wanna just grin and bear it. But I feel like if this message is gonna have the impact that it needs to have on your all's life, then I'm gonna have to get over myself get out of the way and talk about some things that I went through so that you, excuse me, so that you all can be encouraged because I really feel like this message can help you. It can help others. Um, maybe not directly today, but maybe you can remember this message tomorrow or, or throughout the rest of your life of the importance of encouragement. I think we think that encouragement is a personality trait and it's not. It's not a personality trait. It is a gift of the Spirit. It is something that we get to dwell in because our, our Lord, our Savior, died on a cross for us. So now, no matter what tribulations, no matter what trials we may face, we can be in chaos and we can be encouraged. So I, again, I pray that instead of vacillating between, should I, should I send them a kind note? Should I, should I make a phone call? Should I send them a text? They probably don't want to be bothered. I pray we just do it. I pray we get over it and we just start encouraging one another. God commands us as brothers and sisters in Christ to encourage one another. And we're going to study what encouragement actually looks like, what, what lessons I learned about what encouragement actually is, because it was far different than I had uh, really ever imagined, like what I would need and what God would supply me through you all. You know, I had always been um, strong, whatever, however you want to define strong, but I had always been in my mind strong, able to, to manage my life, physically capable, um, just felt like I was healthy. And I'm not, I'm not saying I wasn't, but I was far from where I think God wanted me to be. And um, without a shadow of a doubt, this past year was the most difficult year of my life. Just, I mean, it's not even, there's no Mount Rushmore years. It was last year, no doubt. First and foremost, I was busy. I was busy as I had ever been. And I wasn't just busy with busy things. I was busy with important things. I, I was I was really struggling to find time. I was juggling multiple plates. I was trying to, um, just trying to do more than I was actually capable of doing. I was extremely busy because of things that I had put on myself. It was my problem, not anything that anybody else was doing. But I was busy because I had made myself busy. And I realized that everybody in here would probably characterize themselves as busy. I'm just trying to set the backdrop for what I was really going through last year. You know, I, I, I want to be vulnerable. I want to talk about these things, not because I need a therapy session, but because it is for me to make the point I want to make today. It is so important for you all to know the despair that some people are in. Okay, I had two young, I had two young kids. 
That was enough, okay, I was busy. I'd never had two young kids before, so that was busier than I'd ever been. Um, and that's a full-time job, quite frankly. Then I was working a job that also overwhelms a lot of people, and, and some of those people, many of those people are probably better than me. I mean, a lot of people don't make it in ministry longer than three years. I couldn't imagine doing 40 or 45 or 50. I mean, I just, I can't imagine. I'm sure God will equip me if he wants me to, but I just can't imagine. So uh, I had two young kids, I was working a full-time job that's overwhelming, and it, because it, I mean, it's just taxing to care about people and them to see, seem to not care as much as you would like for them to. Like you caring more than they do about, if we're being honest, the most important aspect of their life, which is their spirituality. Not to mention, <clears throat> on top of all that, I was in school full-time. And not just full-time, but more than full-time because I've got to prove how tough and how strong I am. Nobody was making me do that. I was just a moron. I'll say it, speaking of being vulnerable. You know, <clears throat> so I had all these things. I was a breeding ground for disaster to happen. And there I was thinking, look how well I'm managing this stuff. <clears throat> but in the middle of all that, I was also dealing with, with demons and things that I thought I had dealt with from my childhood. And honestly, I would have told you, I've dealt with these things. I am fixed. I am, I am good. I've moved on. That's what I would have told you if you asked me about it. That's, that's how I felt. I thought it was the truth. And maybe I did, just to be fair to myself, maybe I did fix it as much as I thought it needed to be fixed. But God needed me to heal from it even more than I initially thought because God intends to use that past hurt and that past trauma to help somebody else with it. And we all have trauma. And we all have trauma from, from our childhood or, or even from adulthood. And what we realize is that if we don't face it and we don't deal with it, the older you get, the more it bubbles up, the more it starts to affect you, the more it leaks out. And you thought, well, I was healthy in my 20s. Now in my 30s, I feel like I'm a basket case. And it just keeps re rearing its ugly head. And that's what was, was going on with me. It's like, I thought I dealt with this stuff. But it just came back, or it just kept rearing its ugly head and just kept coming back and coming back. And then the one thing that I had to cope, to deal with, the one thing that I took pride in, the one thing that I used, not unhealthily, the one thing that I used to deal with my problems came crashing down. My physical abilities, my physical health, they all I felt like they got taken away from me. So quite profoundly, my world came crashing down. And I was good, and I had a straight face, and I could smile, uh, as a matter of fact, me smiling so much has gotten me in trouble before. Uh, people are like, why are you smiling? I was like, I, it's just my face. It's just my face. <laughs> uh, last week on the way to church, actually, um, I start sliding down the hill as we're trying to get to church. And I'm in these shoes and they're, they're slick. And so I start sliding and I'm looking at Savannah. And I'm like, oh my goodness, look at this. And she's like, would you quit? You just had brain surgery. You're gonna fall down. I'm like, I'm not doing this on purpose. And she's like, why are you smiling? I'm like, it's my face. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Anyways, <clears throat> again, I apologize. This message is not about me. It's not a therapy session. I want you all to understand where I was because it's gonna put more weight behind the words I'm about to say to you. You know, I don't want this talk to be about me, but I want it to be about the courage that we can gather just to face the next day because sometimes that's all the courage we need. Just help me face tomorrow. So again, I'm, I'm, the physical was tough. There's no doubt about it. The physical was tough. The pain was borderline unbearable at times. I mean, it was, it was not a fun thing that I would go and do again. <clears throat> but there was more going on than just the physical in my life last year. If today's your first time, maybe you need a little bit of... Uh, of backdrop, but I was experiencing some, some, uh, some symptoms, some, some things were going on with me where I just did not feel right. And in July, my doctor finally ordered an MRI. And so we went and we got an MRI and I will never forget. He said, 
He said, you're young, you're healthy, we're not gonna find anything, we're just gonna check a box. I'm like, whoa, okay, well, let's go do this. And he wasn't, I mean, he wasn't wrong. I mean, if anything, he should be praised for just, if anything, God should be praised that that thought crossed his mind because in his eyes, I don't need an MRI, I'm healthy. We're not gonna find anything. But I truly believe that, that God was saying, you need an MRI because you've got something going on with you. And within five minutes of me leaving the, um, the imaging center, they've, my doctor calls me and he says, hey, we found something. <clears throat> and he says, we found an arterial venous malformation. I'm saying, so you're gonna have to repeat that because I have no idea what you just said. And it's kind of funny because now I'll never not be able to pronounce it. But when he told me, I, wasn't, I couldn't pronounce one word of it. I was like, a what? And he's like, we call it an AVM. I was like, okay, I can, I can do alliterations or, or um, acrostics. I cannot do whatever you just said. Anyways, testing and diagnosis, it, it was determined that mom was pretty gnarly. It wasn't just something that they could, um, typically they, they go through your um, artery and your groin, they go up and they block it off and it kind of just withers away and it goes away. But mine was uh, not able to be treated that way. It was in a b bad spot. It was high in complexity, meaning there were just all kinds of these vessels and branches that were tangled into to my brain. And it was that's what was causing my symptoms. What it is, is uh, my arteries and my veins, there were no capillaries in between them to reduce the, the pressure. And so it was just straight blow through on my, um, in my brain from my blood pressure because there was nothing controlling the pressure, which is what your capillaries do. Anyways, so it came to be that I was gonna need a craniotomy. I was gonna have to have I don't know, open head surgery to have the thing removed, right? I couldn't drive. I'm a wildly independent person, so I t felt like my freedom was taken away. I couldn't be as active as I was anymore because it was super dangerous to be active because there's a high chance of, of a hemorrhage when, because your veins are not supposed to have the amount of blood pressure that your arteries can handle. They're not as thick. <clears throat> anyway, so now through all this chaos, it wasn't just, I mean, in, what I just described to you, the physical side and the, and the medical side was enough to be characterized as chaos in my opinion, especially being my age and being as active as I was. I mean, it was, you, you took my freedom away from me, but it was all the other stuff too. So there I was in chaos, but because of you all, but because we have a God in heaven who cares about us, I found myself encouraged. See, I've hit, a new different, I've hit a different level of reliance on him and I'm capable of, of reaching a different level of reliance on him because he gave me no choice. All this stuff got taken out of my hands. All my coping um, habits or whatever were taken away from me and I had to be there in my own head and deal with my demons. And not like I was a basket case and in, incapable of doing my job or anything like that but it was just a lot. It was just a lot. And I knew, I knew that through all this, I was gonna learn something. I had a really wise person tell me, be a good student, be a good student. And I was really, in, I was really uneasy because I knew the insecurities and, and how much help I was gonna need from people now because I couldn't take care of myself like I always had. My faith in God never wavered, but I really was not looking forward to all the lessons I was gonna have to learn from all the help I was gonna to have to get from other people. Because part of my problem was is I didn't wanna put my faith in people. I didn't wanna trust in people anymore because I had been let down by somebody who I should not have been let down from. <clears throat> so here's what I learned. We need encouragement. Here's what I, cl here's what I, cling here's what I clinged to. Psalms 23, six. It says, surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You have no idea how many times I was able to rejoice in that fact over the past year because God used you all to remind me of this. Your life is chaotic, your health, you're in despair, but God's goodness and his loving kindness is following after me because you all were faithful to what he was asking you to do. So thank you. That, that passage right there is one of the most encouraging verses in the entire Bible. 
You, you know that, that chapter if you've attended a funeral. It, that's why it's so popular. Because, it's, because when you read it in a time like that, what you realize is that God is an encourager. And that while your world may have just came crashing down and you may have just have lost somebody you love so dearly, you have a further, you have a ways to go still. And God is going to be with you. His loving kindness is going to follow after you. He wants his people to know that. I am going to be with you. He's going to guide you. He's going to comfort you. He's going to be present. God is an encourager. No matter what chaos, no matter what tribulation, no matter what trial, God's goodness and loving kindness is with us if we seek him, know him, and trust him. That doesn't do people any good if they don't know him, if they don't love him, and they don't, treat, and, and they don't trust him. It doesn't do people any good if, we, if they don't know his words of encouragement, if we don't get into the word and, and study what he's told us and how he's encouraged us. We don't know these things about him. And it really, really doesn't do anybody any good if his people are in obedient to his command to encourage his people. So the first thing I learned last year <laughs> is we need to be encouraged. We need to be encouraged because encouragement is a necessity in the Christian life. First Thessalonians 5.11 says, encourage, encourage one another and build up one another. We are commanded, encourage one another. Why is it our command? Because he knows we're gonna need it. If you wait long enough, I promise you, you are going to be someone who needs encouragement. Or if you wait long enough, you will encounter somebody who is going to need to be encouraged. After the surgeries and the coming of, of realization of how much I had fooled myself into thinking I could make it on my own, I realized I need to be encouraged. I need to let this stuff go so I can let other people help me so that I can move on. You know, I didn't understand how much this was going to not only affect me, but affect my wife. The, the, kid, the kid started picking up on it. I mean, it was just natural. That's just what was gonna happen. And I never thought, I never thought that encouragement was as important as I've found it to be. Like, I don't think I'm important. I don't think I'm significant. I don't even think I'm remotely special, okay? So after the surgeries, to hear that, that people had cried for me, that people had been praying for me, like outside of my wife, I, it was a far-fetched concept to know that this affected other people. I thought it was just going, going to affect me. Then I, I quickly realized the students were affected by it. You all were affected by it. Like I wasn't bearing that gravity by myself and I was so humbled, so humbled. And I was encouraged by that. I was encouraged to get better, to not let this define me, to move on all of the stuff, not just the physical. Because I have people back home who care about me, who I need to get back to. I have a lesson that I need to work on that I can preach. You know, a lot of my problems had to do with my broken view of myself. I'm not, not denying that. But it also had to do with our inability as Christians to openly and verbally encourage one another on a day-to-day -day basis. Like to build one another up. I'm laying there on the hospital bed and I'm telling my wife, I didn't even know people liked me. And now they're crying for me. Like my, if you don't hear anything else I say today, hear this. Don't wait until somebody is down to tell them how much they mean to you Amen. or what you like about them. Our insecurities get in the way. We think if I, if, if I encourage them or I, um, if I compliment them, they're gonna think they're better than me. No, do it because you are commanded to do it because people are living in chaos and they need encouragement. So do it now because you're commanded to and, and know this, eventually, eventually the chaos will find you and you can use that time. You, people 
God will use that time to remind you of how bad you need other people to encourage you. Don't assume they know. That's not me uh, condemning anybody. Again, I said, my problem was my problem. The lesson I learned is that if I'm looking around, we could do a better job of encouraging one another. Don't be afraid to compliment somebody. People need it now. Now, just with things going good, and obviously, when the world comes crashing down. Number two in your outline, it says, encouragement is needed most when life is difficult. So encouragement is just a necessity in the Christian life because we are aliens in a foreign world. This world is against us. If we're standing with Christ, if the, if the world hates Christ, then it's going to hate us. And, and Jesus even tells us in John 16, 33, he says, these things I have spoken to you which is just a long list of encouragement. I've told you these things to encourage you, the things that come before John 16, 33. It says, so that in me, you may have peace. In the world, you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. Take courage. I have overcome the, wor- the world. I love that. I love that phrase. Take courage. Make it yours. Reach out and grab it. Jesus is preemptively encouraging us by telling us that that this is temporary. This world is broken, but I'm fixing all this. I've overcome all this. And you can endure and you will endure if you're in me. But I need you to endure right now because there's something that I need you to do here. And some of that is encouraging our brothers and sisters as they go through tribulation. I want to read this next entire chapter. It's, it's just listed in your outline, but I want to read it because it carries the same theme here. Trial and encouragement. Chaos and encouragement. Like disarray, destruction, but encouragement and peace in the middle of that. Psalms 23 verses one through six says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God reminds us more than anything. I am with you. Everything else is down, but I am with you. And I love the imagery in verse five. It it says, you prepare a table for me before my enemies. That's the epitome of courage and chaos. You can sit there and eat a meal while all your enemies gather around you. Be encouraged. Know that I'm with you. All this other stuff I've overcome. You get to feast You get to feast with God as enemies and trials swirl around you. Psalms 23 gives us insight on what encouragement is too. It's not just, uh, number three in your outline, encouragement is more than just words. It's more than just words. Right here, it tells us that encouragement is his presence, his gifts, his actions, his promises, his attributes. They all encourage us. Who is God? He is our shepherd. He's guiding us along. That should encourage you. Like, what do I have to fear? He's leading the way. Why am I in this, in, uh, why am I so downcast? He is guiding me. His staff is protecting me. I don't have anything to fear. So, uh, it, I am not up here pretending like I wasn't in fear through all this. Oh, I was. I was not looking forward to any of it. And again, it wasn't fun. But encouragement was, encouragement and the courage I had was enough to get me to what it needed to get me to. I didn't fight tomorrow's battles with today's strength. He gave me enough in those moments to get through what I needed to get through. And that's what Psalms 23 is telling us. 
If you need rest, he's going to give you rest. If you need, um, if, if you're walking through the valley of death, he's going to be with you. It doesn't make it any less um, scary, or it does make it less scary, but it doesn't make it, it doesn't, um, I'm trying to say, like you're still, you still have to live. You, I want my, my AVM didn't just go away because I knew God was with me. He gave me enough courage to face my problem, but my problem was still a problem. And it was something I had to go through. Encouragement is more than just words. So what, what, does that, what does that mean in times like that? Like, when we announced what I was going through, the amount of uncomfortable I was going through was immeasurable. Again, I'm, I'm, a, quiet, I'm a private guy, and I want to quietly bear my own bar- burdens. That's just my personality. Encouragement to me was not, was not words. It was, <laughs> it was the aerobics class that Rocky put you guys through while you were in here during service, while we were announcing it. Raise your hand, stand up, sit down. No, I'm sorry, I wasn't leading you through it again. <laughs> raise your hand, stand up, raise your hand, stand up. He sees you. That was encouraging to me. First of all, to know that y'all were willing to do that. But also I laughed a little bit about the visitor who was probably sitting in here because they were like, I don't even know this guy, but I'm not going to be the only one sitting down in here, you know? <laughs> so we made him lie in church, so I got a little kick out of that. But, but I was overwhelmed by the support I was getting in that moment, and it wasn't words you were saying to me. Like, I think a lot of our fear of encouraging one another is because we think it's just words. What if I say the wrong thing? I don't have the words to fix it. You're right, you don't. Um, I've been able to go around with Rocky to, and, and visit a few people while they're going through troubles. And, and I love what he says. He said, we don't have the words to fix this because you can't fix a normal, but we're here for you. We're here for you. A lot of the times encouragement is just your presence, just being there for somebody. I was overwhelmed by the support I was receiving. Acts 28, 15 clues us in on this too. It's, it says, when Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. Just seeing his friends, just seeing other believers, he thanked God and he took courage. They didn't have to say anything. They didn't have to try to fix it with their words. And I love this verse too, Acts 23, 11. I don't think it's in your outline, but, but you can write it down. But the the Lord was, was telling Paul what to do next here in Acts 23. And it says, the Lord stood near and told Paul to take courage. And I don't think it's any accident that it says he stood near. See, he was close. He was in his proximity so that Paul could take courage by knowing that he, his God, his savior, his um, master was present with him. He wasn't just giving him commands and not equipping him to go forward. He was with him. I love that. There's this thing called the ministry of the present, being there for people when they need you most. God offers comfort and encouragement to us. Um, This way too, Jesus, when he was talking to his disciples, he was saying, go and do these things and know I am with you. That's Matthew 28, 19, if you wanna write it down. The presence is important and it is encouraging. And I think that that's why it takes so many girls to go to the bathroom together, okay? They need courage. (laughs) They need a a herd of girls to get to the bathroom. A lot of encouragement is music. You know, it marks off a time in your life where where you were downcast, where you were fighting battles, and they were just little reminders of God has not forgotten you. And so you hear this song and it takes you back to a season of your life. And you remember, God was with me and I was encouraged. It's not just words, it's letters, it's gifts, it's emails, it's text messages, it's a smile. It's just acknowledging the pain that somebody might be going through. It's not only words, so don't cower behind you thinking that you're not eloquent in speech enough to encourage somebody. The other truth we learn about encouragement is is if we do it well, if it's God's people, As brothers and sisters in Christ, if we do encouragement well, we follow the biblical model of what encouragement is, it helps keep us from sin. 
Hebrews 3.13 says, encourage one another day after day as long as it is still called today. And I love that. As long as it's today, encourage one another. Because somebody's probably going through something where they need some encouragement. And it says, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. The despair people find themselves in is the breeding ground for the devil to attack them, for the enemy to distract them, and they're sitting ducks to be sinful, to indulge, and to turn away from the God who's not forgotten them. That's what that is. But if we can encourage one another, if we can do the things that God has commanded us to do, again, I'll tell you, you have no idea how many times I was able to think, God, you've not forgotten me because of your all's faithfulness. Romans 2, 4 says, or do you not think lightly of the riches of his kindness and his tolerance and his patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? That is, that's an encouraging start to the verse to say that it is, you are not encouraged so that you can go on sinning and not change anything about your life. God is good to you, not to leave you room to sin, but to leave you room to change. That's why God's good to you. Like, you are hearing truth today so that you have an opportunity to keep it tomorrow, so that you have an opportunity to keep it today. Don't walk out of here and squander the truth that God has brought to us today through his word. You can change. Uh, 2 Peter 3, 9 talks about this too. It says, the Lord is not slow to his promise as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. The good is not, again, room for you to go on sinning. It's room for you to change. If you listen to these words, if we encourage one another, it will help keep us from sin. It will allow us to change. Uh, it's in the same vein that, that Rocky said last week. He says, don't, don't mistake God's patience for his indifference. Likewise, don't mistake God's encouragement God's encouragement for acceptance. God sees you for what you could be, not for what you currently are. So when he's encouraging you, he's encouraging you to go on, to move, to change, to get better, to stop sin and sinning, to start doing his will. And if we do that, we start experiencing encouragement. Joshua, when I was preparing for this lesson, I mean, just obviously the first um, place to go is Joshua. And over and over and over, it talks about the relationship between encouragement and God's word. Encouragement and God's word. Encouragement and doing what God tells us to do. You wanna find real encouragement, stay obedient. Stay obedient, do what he has commanded you to do. So you can write down Joshua one, read verses seven through nine, but, but over and over it says, be careful to do according to the law and take courage. Because if you keep being obedient, Joshua, you're going to be what I want you to be, what I, what I know you can be, and you have enough courage to lead these people. And you all have enough courage to do what God has asked you to do. He has equipped you. I'm living proof. I'm living proof. Number five in your outline, because I'm about to take it up a level, okay? It's not just being nice to each other. Number five in your outline is encouragement should be generous because you never know what people are going through. Your time, your money, your words, whatever it is that you're offering as encouragement to your brother, your sister should always be generous because you never know what they're go going through. You never know what they're going through. You all knew that I was dealing with the physical thing, but nobody really knew about the other stuff I was dealing with. Nobody knew about the other stuff that y'all were, y'all were encouraging me through my physical. And what you didn't realize is that you were helping me heal, heal spiritually too because of my, my past and my trauma. There God was supplying the strength I needed to get through what I needed to get through so that I could become what he wanted me to become. We're not gonna read this, but Philippians 4.19 
That's, that's God supplying. And that's why this church being involved in a body of believers, a physical body, actually attending, not just saying I'm a member, is so important. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25 says, and let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembly uh, together as is habit, habit for some, but encouraging one another. The reason you're here today should not just be what do I get from this place? It should be, I'm showing up today to encourage my brother and sister in Christ because I don't know what they're going through. I want to encourage them and I want to encourage them generously because I don't know, you don't know what people are going through. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but I would say that our society as a whole is not very healthy today. So it's pretty fair to assume that somebody in here today might feel like they are stuck in chaos. And we can pretend like we don't see them and walk and get their coffee and, and, and leave early and show up late and all that stuff. But the, but the truth is God sees you as what you could be and what he's asking us to do, what he's commanding us to do is to show up and encourage one another to show up and care enough about that person to ask how they're doing and to tell them you love them, to tell them you care about them. So don't just show up to get something, show up to add something. A part of my journey through this was removing that part of me, removing just the, the thought that I knew what was going on in people's life. I had to get over that, I had to realize Somebody needs you to be who only you can be to them. God uses his people to meet the needs of his people spiritually. God uses you to meet the needs of his people spiritually. That is a, uh, an esteemed assignment. God thinks enough of you to command you and to ask you to be a an encourager to somebody who might be going through something, being his hands and his feet. And as cross followers, both past, present, and future, we are, a, we are called to be obedient to this commission, to go and encourage one another as Christ came and encouraged us. The... Um, why, why do they need that again? I'll reiterate, because life is hard. Life is hard. Just your everyday uh, run-of-the-mill life, average living in America is difficult. It may not be persecution, but it's difficult because we, we just put so much outside pressure on ourselves. We just put so, much, so many unnecessary distractions and, and weights and, and all that stuff on our life for no reason. So other people need to, we need to be encouraged by other people. We need somebody who can see our situation for what it really is and encourage us through it. And one of the best ways that happens is through God's word. So let's look at how God's word is an encourager. So God's words as encouragement in your outline. The first thing it does is God's, God's word equips us. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 says, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching. And verse 17 says, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. God's word, first and foremost, equips us. It's for our benefit. You're gonna need it. We are in so much despair collectively as a society and we don't think that we have what we need. And God is saying, you have everything you need in my word. I am equipping you for these good things. If you wanna read Psalms 42, again, the psalmist is, is wrestling with his emotional state and continues to remind himself, I have God's word. I have what I need most. How did he do that? How was he able to recall God's word and to, and to think of the, the things that he needed to think of in, in his moments of despair? Because he had committed God's word to memory. He'd actually read the thing. And then the Holy Spirit, like every time you read your Bible, I tell, my, I tell the kids this, it's an investment. It's an investment. One five minute quiet time 
I don't know if, I don't know if that's always going to change your life. It's probably not. But that one five minute quiet time daily throughout the year is an investment in your future. Because one day you're going to need to remember some of the things that you've been reading. It's an investment that you can go back to, that you can draw from when you need to. And the Holy Spirit brings that, back, brings that to us because we've put in the work. We've committed ourselves to knowing God's word because we believe it can equip us. If you don't believe it can equip you or it can help you, it's gonna get really des- dusty on your bedside because you're never gonna open it because you don't think it's of any use. Some people are gonna have a lot to deal with when they go home and brush the dust off of their uh, Bible tonight. It's there to equip you. Do you believe, do you have enough faith to believe that? It's like, you need to know things like Exodus 14, 14, where God tells us that he fights for us, we only need to stay still. You need to know that because at one point in your life, I promise you, you're gonna, you're gonna realize, I can't do this. At one point, you're gonna realize that this is out of my hands. I just need to sit here and be still and let God fight for me. I can get through this because God's word is equipping me to get through this. And, what, and it's equipping you with courage. Number two in your outline there, God's word encourages us. Encourage means to have courage. It's a resource, it's a tool that you're able to access when the enemy tries to overwhelm you. That's why I said earlier, when, when Jesus told, us to, to, told his disciples to take courage, it's yours. You are deciding if you want to take it or not, but it's there for you. Committing God's word again to memory will encourage you often. Because it's just, I don't know how I'm gonna make it through this. And then a verse pops into your head and like, I'm glad that was there. You know, it's why he told Joshua in in verse eight, he said, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and you will have success. Deuteronomy six tells us, write these things everywhere. Talk about this stuff all the time, God's law, God's word, because you're gonna need it. And you never know when you're gonna need it. Because life can change in an instant. Your situation can change in an instant. Like if it's not around you all the time, then you're gonna start allowing other things to define your situation, to paint your reality. Like trivial example here, I'll give you you one though. How in, and no offense, about to get into somebody's personal life here, I know. Treading lightly. How inconsequential, if I'm being honest, sorry, men, are sporting events? They just don't matter. They just really don't. But think about how much we let that influence our mood. We let it influence our day. We let it influence our emotions. I mean, you got, you've, got, <laughs> you've got guys who you've never seen cry, and then Tennessee beats Alabama, and they're boo-hooing. You're like, what in the world? The reality is, is that it doesn't matter right now that Tennessee beat Alabama last year. Maybe a little bit, maybe just. Uh, <laughs> what mat- what the reality is, is that no matter what's going on over there in La La Land or on the hill or, or anywhere else, the reality is that what is going to define my situation, what is going to define my reality, my emotions and how I feel about something is the truth is the truth. Not some 18 to 26 year olds throwing a football around. And that stuff creeps into our life when we don't meditate on who God is and and his word. It blows my mind. We can stay up all night to watch the Super Bowl, but man, I'm tired and I don't wanna open that thing up before I go to bed. Give me a break. No, seriously, I need a break. Does anybody else wanna come up here and do this? The point is, is that the outside stuff can't be the defining factor on our mood. It can't be. And that's just a trivial trivial example of how we let it. And I hope it's convicting. 
We need to shift our reality. Because number three in your outline, God's word defines reality for us. I wish I had more time to talk about this. And I I love that we just sang this song, but Hebrews 6, 18 through 19 says that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope that sets before before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both steadfast and one which enters within the veil. There's a lot that, that we need to unpack there, but real quickly, The two unchangeable things that happened here is God made a promise to us on his name. First and foremost, it's it's impossible for God to lie. So he doesn't have to swear by any other name. There's nothing higher for him to swear by. But he wanted us to be so reassured that he is going to see us through, that he is going to remain faithful to us. He triple stamped a double stamp. He said, no matter what, I am going to be faithful. See, Hebrews 6, 13 through 17, write that down because that's what came before the past two verses. It's God promising Abraham, I am going to see this through. And so when I'm sitting there in chaos, what I know is that God is going to see me through. And that even if death is my future, it is a, it is a mere comma in the sentence. And eventually I will be with him because he is unchangeable. My situation, changeable. My circumstances, changeable. My emotions, changeable. But he is not. He is not. We've, God's word changes our reality, it defines our reality, and it fixes our perspective. It's no longer life under the sun, S-U-N, that Ecclesiastes says. It's life under heaven that Ecclesiastes says in verse 3, 1. It's a mood, it's a perspective shift. It's not just the futility of this world. It's there's something bigger going on here. There's a God in heaven who cares about me. It's not this lowly perspective of, of under the sun. It's eternity in heaven. Because if everything just ends, then what's the point to anything? But everything doesn't just end. Like I just said, we get to walk through death and we get to see Jesus. There is purpose behind the hurt and the chaos that you're going through now. The reality is that that God makes all things work together for the good of those who love him, no matter what that situation is. So that's God's word as encouragement. We're about to fly through these, okay? The next is God's people as encouragement. Our responsibility is, in the, in, the, uh, in the role of encouragement to God's people. How we live our lives can encourage others. There was a person I thought about the entire time I was gone. I, mean, I just, he's my hero. I just kept thinking that I cannot believe he's gone through what he's gone through and he's walked this well through it. In Colossians 4.18, it says, I, Paul, write these greetings with my own hand. Remember my imprisonment. Grace be with you. Paul is saying, remember my situation, remember what I'm going through and have encouragement because if I can do this, you can do this. And there was this guy that I was thinking about and I was like, oh my goodness, I cannot believe that this was his situation. I came and I told him this and I, and I was like, thank you. You don't even realize how much you've meant to me, but just me outside looking in was so much encouragement to me. And he said, it's just life. And I'm like, okay, turn the perfect off, buddy. Okay, let's... It's not just life. Sometimes it's not just life. Sometimes it's really tough. But it is so encouraging to know that if other people can go through it, I can go through it as well. So how you live your life is is encouraging to others. Praying for others encourages them. I'm a big fan of this one. Colossians 4.12 says, uh, Epaphras, who is one of your number, just saying he, he's one of you all, a bond slave of Jesus Christ sends you his greeting. And it says this about him. It says, always laboring earnestly for you, for you in his prayers. And if you don't know what to pray for somebody, pray this, that you may stand perfect and fully assured in all the will of God. Pray that. It's real easy. He's given us the, the, the clues here. Um, 
just a real quick note about, again, my situation. After we asked you all to pray for me, like the momentum shifted drastically in my life. It took a new direction. Um, it was a lot of what was going on before we announced it, before it was like, we were just weren't getting answers. It was, we don't wanna work on it. We don't wanna treat it. Uh, we'll just treat the symptoms and give you medicine uh, to fix you. And um, just more diagnostics, more diagnostics, so on and so forth. And then the final straw, not the final straw, but the, the last thing was the angiogram I had when the neurologist said like, I can't work on this. It's too complex. Um, it's just out of my realm of capabilities. And he said the two, and we were like, well, can we get another opinion on this? And he was like, well, the two best ones are Indiana or Duke. Those are the two best in the area that you could like drive to and seek care from. So literally that next week, we talked to you all. And after that, and it's hard to remember that I really don't remember a lot of September and December for various reasons, but um, a few weeks later, the neurologist chooses Duke. And then I find out that, I have a, that I've had a cousin who's had one of these things, and they went to Duke as well. And oddly enough, without me knowing any of this, she had hers worked on by the same neurosurgeon that I'm going to see. It definitely had something to do with all of you all praying for me. Because it went from no answers, I can't work on it, to, hey, you've had a family member who's had one of these things, and here's the surgeon who's done it. Go meet him. And then, and then we, we meet with him and we were like, I said, are you pretty confident in this uh, surgery? He goes, I did one Tuesday. I was like, okay, well, there we go. How cool. And it went from, there was, because you guys were here praying the, I knew, and I knew that, I just had this overwhelming peace to know like, no matter what bad news comes next, I'm gonna be okay. I was encouraged by your prayers. Even when he told me, he said, we've got to do another MRI and you need one centimeter of clearance for me to be able to work on this thing and take it out. And now I look at this car and I'm like, one centimeter, dude? It seems like you had a ton of real estate. But anyways, <laughs> um, just because of where it was located, he was going to have to move stuff around and, and go in there and get it out. I was like, I'm going to be okay. And I wish I would have sent this, but I wish you guys could read the report because where he needed one centimeter of clearance on the report that we got to read in our portal, it says one centimeter of clearance, 1.5 centimeters of clearance. And he said, I can, I can work on this. We can get this thing out. And I believe that that happened because of prayer. Did God have the ability to, to heal me in the middle of the night and fix that? Absolutely, absolutely. But what he chose to do is to use his saints praying for me so that I can find encouragement and learn the lessons that I needed to learn by enduring what I needed to endure. So the other thing I learned here is, is God's people were encouragement is we are blessed to bless. First Corinthians 12, seven says, but to each one is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. And, some, and that manifestation oftentimes is through encouragement through encouragement, build one another up. And the final thing I wanna leave you with is encouraging others results in encouragement for you. You reap what you sow. Galatians 6, 9 says, do not lose heart in doing good for in due time we will reap. If we do not grow weary, keep encouraging. Keep encouraging. One of the best feelings in the world is to help someone and tell no one. To, walk, to have no selfish end in mind, to just help them. Like, wow, that was amazing. I don't have to post on Facebook how good I am. Like the Bible tells us that if we, if we are doing this for the approval of men, then we have received our reward. So all those likes you're gonna get on Facebook, that's all you're gonna get. But when you encourage a brother in secret, when you help them uh, in secret, your God in heaven is going to reward you. Luke 6, 38 says, give and it will be given to you. Give encouragement and it will be given to you. And that doesn't mean it turns into a, a compliment fest. It's not what I'm saying there. It means when you need it the most, encouragement will find you because you've given it to other people. 
Again, all your decisions now are an investment in your, in your future. I think at one point in our lives, we all think that my todays are not connected to my yesterdays or my tomorrows, but boy, are they. All your yesterdays and all your todays are all connected to your tomorrows. So make good decisions today. Walk faithfully today. Sow encouragement today because one day you are going to need it. One day you're really gonna need it. I love that my job the past few years has been, like I've always loved the Bible. I've always studied it. I've always uh, read it since I've been a, since I've been a Christian, but these past few years, I'm so thankful that I had to read it from the perspective of, I've, I need to learn from this to teach somebody else. What I did not understand is I was building a stockpile of knowledge for what I was going to need one day, for the cur courage that I was going to need to draw from one day for the stuff I was about to face. One of the biggest lessons in all of this is Jesus says, take courage. God tells Joshua to be courageous. The option is there for you to not be. Eventually, eventually, you are going to have to be the person to encourage yourself. The option is there for you to not. I pray that we realize that, we have, that God has adequately equipped us to endure what we need to endure, to endure what we're going to go through. And we need to access that thing. But not only that, we as people need to encourage one another every single time these doors are open. So for me, because of my church, encouragement was there for me. But I had to choose to take it, to not let my past get in the way, for me not to think that my deficiencies and, and, the way, and the way I think that people perceive me is going to get in the way of me accessing this encouragement that they've provided for me. It's accepting the courage that God was providing to me through many of you all. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for allowing me to have the option to be courageous in the middle of my chaos. I hope that my speaking to you this morning leaves you just the same maybe in chaos, but encouraged to know that you can walk through this and that Psalms 23 is for you too.